You must be feeling like it was a miracle. Well, I think uh, if I was picking words, you pick the right word. You pick the right word. It was a miracle, absolute miracle. Tony Bullimore was two months into the Vendée Globe around the world yacht race. It's the toughest challenge of them all, single-handed and non-stop. Tony was sailing his 60-foot yacht, Exide Challenger. And by the start of the new year, he was well into the Southern Ocean, 1,300 miles south of Australia. At last, things seemed to be going well. I'm down to 57 South, further than I've ever been, but I want to go down to 60. That's my cutoff point. Iceberg territory. I've been across the Atlantic about 30 times, but there's no doubt this was the toughest race I've ever been in. That's funny, the barometer's dropped to 980. It's been around 1,010 for the last few days. I reckon I'm in for a blow. I have got a great respect for the sea. One minute you can be at sea and it, it can be beautiful, tranquil, and the next minute it can become a monster. Now, all of a sudden, we're, we're looking at 40, 50 knots of wind. The seas are building like hell. The wind is really blowing. And the boat is sort of tearing down waves at relentless speeds. And, uh, and that was only the beginning. The size of the waves is telling you something. The, the wind strength is telling you something. The grayness of the sky is telling you something. It's telling you to get your canvas down. It's telling you to get some food uh, down into your belly because in the next few hours you may be on the helm for hour after hour. I'm doing 22, 23, 24, 25. God almighty, I can pitch pole with these waves. It's telling you to clear the decks of all your bits of kit and equipment that don't need to be there. You're in pretty rough conditions, so hang on in there because, uh, you know, if you don't hang on in, uh, you, you know, you're not going to make it. I realised that there was big waves all around me. I mean, uh, I think they were 50, 60 foot easy. Massive waves, you know, and they were, they were, they were rumbling along. The kind of rumbling you would get when you get an avalanche. seas really want to get angry and you get the big winds and, and the sea really starts to boil and you get up to wind strengths like 9, 10, 11, 12, up to hurricane strengths, then the sea becomes uh, a pretty horrendous place to be. I'd been on the helm for about seven hours. I was fatigued. I was getting so tired. I really needed to rest. I'm in the middle of a raging storm, you know, and I thought, well, just, I've got to get some food down me, so I, I opened a tin of corned beef and I squirted a load of old, good old-fashioned ketchup over it, mixed it in, I got a pile of Rivita biscuits, I got that down me.
doesn't last for long because um, you get you get lonely and, and you've been together for such a long time, the companionship and little chit chat you, you miss because the little chit chat we have. Deep down in my stomach, I was knocking on death's door. I was way down south, you know, way past 50 degrees south, uh, and there was little hope of rescue. What's that tapping? Tap, tap, tap. God, it's the boom. It's tapping on the window. I don't think there'll be any problems. Perspex is 12 mil reinforced. It's going to hold out, there's no doubt about that. Uh, let's get some sleep. Let's get 10 or 15 minutes sleep. Half an hour with a bit of luck. There's nothing I can do until the storm passes over. Fear. <laughs> There's no point in being frightened. I mean, you know, the position was what the position was. How was I uh, going to get out of this? But the greatest fear is fear itself. You may have heard that before. Freezing. I thought I was cold before, but now I'm really freezing. Got to get my survival suit on now. Is the hull going to fill up completely? If it does, I've got to get out. If I get out, I've got nowhere to go. The life raft is pinned under the cockpit sole. thing is get the distress beacon out onto the surface, tie some line to it, tie it off on uh, something firm in the boat, get it tied around the distress beacon, make sure it don't float away, that would be disastrous. I'll 
switch it on, make sure she's working okay. Dive down to the broken window and poke it out. Christ, it's cold. Tony boy, if you're not careful, coldness is going to kill you. If a rescue doesn't come in the next few days, I bought it. Maritime Rescue, good evening. Yes, he tell. Another one. Further south this time. Have you got the coordinates? Okay, when are you sending them? All right, I think they're coming through now. Yeah, okay, leave it with me. I'll have a look at them and see what we can do. Okay. John? Yeah, we've got another one down in the Southern Ocean. Okay. Global Challenger. Okay. Could you get out a distress relay? All ships within 400 miles, there's the position. Okay. Well okay, done. thanks. Good day, Paul. Paul, we appear to have another one in the Southern Ocean. Yeah, further south this time. Yeah, look, this is just a heads up. We haven't got the full information from MRCC and ETEL. Yeah, they're going to give me further details as soon as they're confirmed. But to, could you just check and see what the availability of aircraft is for that position? It's well south this time. Thanks, Paul. Good afternoon. Two more yachts are in trouble in the seas south of Australia. Distress signals have been picked up from two boats taking part in the Vendée Global Round the World race. One is the British yacht, the Exide Challenger. So far, there's no news of her skipper, Tony Bullimore. It's amazing, everything's getting sucked out of the boat. God, the boat's gonna end up empty if I'm not careful. Got to look after the water maker, got to look after the little bit of survival kit that I've got left. Where's my tool kit? Where's my laptop? Everything's gone. All my novels are gone. I wouldn't read them now anyway, but everything's disappearing. The boat's gonna end up empty, apart from me. machine from hell. Just as well eat the last of the chocolate. I haven't got to worry about food anymore, I haven't got any. This morning at uh, quarter past one, we got a call from uh, Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre. What we have uh, is two pairs of Argus beacons in the water from two yachts in the Vendée Globe. So on this occasion, we're about 1,300 miles from uh, Perth. Antarctica is closer, 840 miles away, no airfields. An Orion aircraft was now loaded with air sea rescue kits known as ASRKs and all the equipment needed for a round-the-clock search for Terry Dubois and Tony Bullimore. So began the biggest air-sea rescue in the history of the RAAF. It would involve four aircraft, six aircrew, and 190 hours of flying.
I just opened the door to get out. Got to get to the life raft. Got to get it free. Sliced off my finger. Look at the bone sticking out of my finger. It's unbelievable. I can't feel much pain. I'll have to wrap it up with something anyway. Blood stopping. It's probably the cold. By four o'clock on Monday, the Australian frigate HMAS Adelaide was on her way south. Ahead lay three days of sailing. You hear there, Captain speaking. You're all aware that we're now on our way down to effect a rescue, hopefully, of uh, one Bullimore and Dubois. This is something that very few of us had any experience at before or anything we've done before. We're going further south than any Australian ship has ever gone to effect a rescue, some 1,400 nautical miles. We have to find them yet, and I have to get down there. This whole ship has to get down there through the unkindest ocean in the world. Right now we're going as fast as we can. Uh, fuel is a factor for me. I've got to be able to get down there and get back. Uh, and I'm waiting to hear if, uh, if the tanker, West Australia, HMS West Australia, is going to be able to sail. Now if she can sail, I'll try to go faster using two engines. Uh, which with both my engines, which obviously increases my fuel consumption. This whole mission uh, could be very dependent on the helicopter. The helicopter will give us an extra uh, almost 10 hours and fly ahead the time it'll take me to drive the ship down there. There's no question that this is the longest range search and rescue operation that's ever been carried out from Australia. In fact, I don't know of that many that have been carried out at this range from anywhere in the world. Our search is definitely limited by fuel. We have enough fuel to transit approximately three hours to on station, uh, we have four hours on station of search, and then another three hours to return back home again. So this is probably as far as I'd like to see anything like this happen. In fact, really, it's about twice as far as I'd like to see it happen. The difficulty of the search is bordering on extreme. Um, the salt spray is, is completely wiping out the front windscreen, so the pilots are on instruments all the time. There's low cloud, there is high wind conditions, high sea states, it's very difficult for the observers, and we've just got to make the best of it. After four hours of flying, the RAAF Orion spotted Terry Dubois clinging to the upturned hull of his yacht. It's contact. Take him in or it's contact. Okay, the survivors on the yacht. Stand on top. Okay, Terry, this is the, the best of slip down day. We'll put the ASAT in here. Stand by for the ASAT. Stand by the top. ASAT going. Now. Okay, Port Aft, I'll be asking you for an assessment as to what how close the life raft will be blown to it. Roger. 
Okay, the uh, raft is upturned and uh, no way near it. Okay guys, uh, it doesn't look like that first day of South Wales in the ballpark, we'll have to put the second one in. That's okay going now. Okay, yep, the strut looks good. Okay, the uh, the base okay looks like it will strut limp much, okay? You should be able to see that out your window now. We all thought we'd missed when the dinghies were released to uh, Jerry Dubois. When we came round to see that he'd actually got hold of the rope and was hauling himself towards the dinghy, it was, um, well, it was like winning a cup final, to be honest. The RAAF Orions had notched up their first success, but they still had to find Tony Bullimore. I do have some very good news. The Air Force have just let us know that they have found Mr. Dubois, so we now certainly have a mission, and that is to get down there and recover him. The search for uh, Mr. Bullimore continues. At this stage, they have not found his yacht and we're still working off his beacon of distress. I was lucky to have a little uh, handheld uh, water maker. To make one mug of water, it took a thousand pumps and I wanted at least five mugs a day. What with hypothermia, dehydration, the feet turning into blocks of ice, my head beginning to buzz. I've got to try to pull myself together. The human eyeball is our number one sensor at this time, so we'll just uh, fly close track spacing, work our way back towards the hull, and uh, do everything we can to gain a visual contact. Um, it, it all comes down to visual in any search and rescue. You can't deploy a life raft to a target you can't see. By Monday evening, the Exide Challenger was spotted. Bark, 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 left, 9 o'clock, something in the water, it looks like an upturned yacht. About three quarters of a mile. Visual tagging over. Visual tagging over. Visual tagging over. We're going to try to initiate a response. We're going to drop um, a device in the water which puts out an electronic signal, an electronic ping. In order to hear that response, uh, we'll drop sauna boys in the water. We've dropped the sauna boys, but we're hearing no response. Okay, uh, put down the port beam, uh, up to the yacht, no keel, and uh, no sign of life. As we uh, searched for the yacht, and indeed as, as we found it, to a man, people were extremely pleased that they were in the aeroplane and not in, in, that, in that cauldron of foam. We just talked about Bullimore all the way home, how he would be feeling. Um, you know, what would it be like to be in that situation, you know? And I would really hope that no one would ever give up on me. I, I came aware that he was in trouble on the Monday morning. Yvonne, my niece, phoned up to say that, um, would I put the television on? Because um, she think something wrong with uncle. And I put the television on and there he was. There was the boat. All I could see was the bottom of the boat with number 33. And that's all I remember. I can't remember what the announcer was saying because my head had gone completely. It all came flooding in. Um, what had happened in the past, 
the past accidents that he had at sea, it all came back, you know. The, the, the memory of him sitting in intensive care with all those wires attached to his body, all that came back. And I knew then it was serious. So I, I talked to him. I talked to him. But he didn't answer. The aim and objective was to get the life raft free so that I've got a, another line of defence. I swam out of the doghouse into the, the cockpit about a dozen times because I can only hold my breath for probably about a minute and a half. There's no way I'm going down in the boat. If the boat starts to go down, I'm going to dive out. I'm going to try to get to the life raft. Hang on, hope that it floats to the surface, and give it a pull. If I don't, then I'll swim away from the boat, and I'll hang on until the end. I want to be a free bird. I don't want to go down in the boat like it's my watery coffin. There's no way I'm going down in the boat. float away, see the stars or the sun, or even if it's just thick clouds, I want to be free. God, I'm freezing. My hands are so cold and my feet. My head's feeling pretty cold too now. I'm going to freeze to death. Mike, you better come and have a look at this weather. Huh. Doesn't it's look a, very good, does it? No, it's that front that's been through there. Mm. A bit of a break here, and I see well, there's another front coming, start of another front coming where through. Where do you reckon here. Adelaide is now? Just, yeah, I think it's about, about there. here, off uh, Cape Lewin. It's going to be a race, isn't it? Sure is. By Tuesday, the refuelling tanker Westradia was cleared to leave port. Now the Adelaide could start its second engine, increase its speed, and try and beat the incoming weather. CCS bridge, engine ahead, 30 knots. Ahead, please, sir. If he is down there, how soon can I get down there? To? Australia is going to sail. She's going to get down here and fuel me. I'm now going as fast as you can see from the weather conditions, as fast as it's going to allow me to go. Now the latest on the Exide Challenger. The Australian frigate HMAS Adelaide is now more than two days away from the capsized yacht. But there's still no indication if Tony Bullimore is alive under the hull or whether he's been swept away in the heavy seas. So cold, so tired. Oh God, what would I give for a really nice hot meal? 
mug of tea, cigarette, sit down somewhere nice and warm. Oh, love, what have I done? I was petrified, really, really worried. Wonder why they'd taken so long to get to him. But I know Tony wouldn't give up easily because he's stubborn. He liked life too much. He wouldn't just, he wouldn't just, he would fight to the end. I didn't know it was so far. And I couldn't get to him. And that was, was hard was really hard. I, I don't think I'd like to go through that again. But, no. Don't even want to think about it. No. They hurt, the not knowing, the fear, everything. The suffering. I suffer, he suffered. I'd bought it at one time. I absolutely thought I'd bought it. I thought I wasn't going to get out of um, this one. You know, I thought I was a goner. There's a series of fronts coming across uh, from the west across the Southern Ocean, uh, which are going to affect tomorrow's uh, rescue of Bullimore in a big way, and we're going to have to uh, pick the gap best we can. That's if Bullimore's alive. It's going to, we're going to have to. We'll reach Bullimore's yacht tomorrow, and regardless of he's alive uh, or dead, I'm going to have to go into that hole to establish that fact. Yeah, so eight missions in three days. We maintain continuous contact with uh, Terry Dubois and uh, continue to search for Bullimore. And uh, things are looking uh, a, a bit grim for Tony Bullimore. Tony Bullimore is a battler, according to his friends, but it's nearly three days since the Exide Challenger capsized. And the question the rescue team is asking could anyone survive that long in the freezing waters of the Southern Ocean? I was in the dark, pitch dark. So everything got into the mind, and it gave me time to think over my life. I got my scowls out in my mind, you know, and started weighing up the good and the bad. I decided I'd led quite a good life, really. Some things were a bit sad. Uh, there was one or two bits of unfinished business, one or two projects that I wanted to get involved in. And obviously, I, would, I was very sad that I wouldn't be with my wife anymore.
and I've got a lot of faith. And I did a lot of prayers, prayed a lot. I read the Bible. And then I talked to him, and then he answered. But I've heard his voice in my head, and I saw him. I saw him. I saw him sitting in the boat on the shelf, with his, with his sitting like that. I saw him as plain as, as plain as day. I saw him, and I talked to him. Whether you want to call it madness or what, I don't know, but I saw him. I thought, now's the time to pray. I wanted to pray whilst I felt my mind was still strong enough for me uh, to pray in my own special way. I go on a journey, a journey through time, a journey through space, and I actually, uh, I go to seek an answer, help, an answer. I actually was taken to uh, a very ancient house and there was a lot of people in a room sitting and standing around in small groups talking. We had words and then I was told, keep going, you'll get there, you'll get there. Dear Lord, we pray for our love at this time. Give us the strength to fall down. And Lord, we pray that you be with Tony at this time. We pray for the captain to reach him. On the bridge, Lieutenant Oborn has the ship and the con. Course 200, zero zero, ma'am. Very good. Now, good day, mate. It's the D. Um, for your flight details, uh, Mr. Dubois, the person they're picking up tomorrow, 173 centimetres tall. Weighs in at 70 kilos, and his immersion suit is the type that has water in it. However, he has almost nil in there. The upturned Exide Challenger was further south. The frigate would reach it in three hours, but would the weather permit a rescue? If the survivor has battened himself down inside the living compartment, then he may well be in there and will be trapped in there. And given the water pressure on the, on the bulkheads immediately after him, he will not be able to get out, which means that if he's in there, we're going to have to cut through the hole. Center up from the P3. Uh, weather is uh, to the south, they've got a front, they hold on radar at about 10 miles and there's further weather down to the southeast. As the ship got closer, the Adelaide's crew was on tenterhooks. Any moment now, they would catch their first glimpse of the Exide Challenger.
on everyone's mind was a single question. Was Tony Bullimore still alive in that grim looking hull? God, it sounds like a plane. It can't be. We found that we could get alongside the starboard side of the uh, of the yacht. We secured ourselves on, and then we started banging on the hull. When I heard the uh, the banging on the side of the hull, big heavy banging, it was it was like heaven. It was like heaven. And it took me seconds to get from one end of the boat to the other, and then a few deep breaths. I dived out the boat and over. But boy, when I saw this ship, uh, it was heaven, absolute heaven. All we could hear from the ship is, he's in the water, he's in the water on the other side. And we all looked at each other and uh, at that stage, uh, uh, I looked at the diver and we made the decision, diver went in the water, we broke away as quickly as we could and, and uh, went around the stern of the yacht and there he was in the, in the water. to see him bobbing around and of course personally I think I just reflected the whole feeling that was on the ship, that just the elation that flowed through and very quickly the entire ship, 145 people knew that we had succeeded. The expression on the man's face will live with me forever. You could see when he reached the surface and started swimming, there was a man who'd, who'd been through a hell of a lot and was just so glad to see us. Uh, yes, he was exhausted but he was, he was certainly glad. Oh, he didn't stop talking. He didn't stop talking the whole time. Well, I, I guess uh, I felt elated that he was found alive. Uh, and he, I think he's a very lucky man. find him alive and, and to get him back was just a, a, a magnificent feeling. It was just terrific. And to get him back on board and get two out of two was uh, a marvellous outcome. It, it's a great feeling.
you can call it luck, you can call it a miracle. Uh, I'll call it a miracle. Hello, Wesley. Wesley, it's Mike here. Good, thanks, Wesley. Wesley, great news. Yep, he's alive and well. He's alive. It was like the heaven opened up. All the stress has just drained from my body. One tenacious man, but he's obviously uh, someone was there looking after him. Maybe I, I, I'm not a musician to answer those questions, but for me, it's changed that you never give up hope. I think it's a tremendous uh, lesson for all of us here. You must be feeling like it was a miracle. Well, I think uh, if I was picking words, you'd pick the right word. You'd pick the right word. It was a miracle, absolute miracle. And I thought, I better not get his vintage champagne up because I'll be in trouble. <laughs> so I opened a bottle of champagne and that went very quickly. And then I saw some brandy and I opened that as well. <laughs> I saw a bottle of Bacardi and I opened that as well. And we drank and then I saw God been good to me. So I went back upstairs and thanked him for saving his life. And I went to sleep for the first time in four days, and that was lovely. Australia for giving me back my life. Thank you very much. Nothing more to say.